I went to school and studied hard because I thought if I did better in school, I'd get a better job and I'd make more money. But that's not how it works. You will never get rich from your labor alone. We were never taught that part. Jaspreet is a serial entrepreneur and licensed attorney on a mission to spread financial education through his business, The Minority Mindset, and his extremely popular YouTube channel of the same name. Growing up, I knew that I wanted to be financially successful or rich or whatever you want to call it. So I started my own like entrepreneurial ventures when I was really young. Like I started mowing my neighbor's lawns when I was like 10 years old, but my parents always discouraged me. They were like, no, don't do that. Focus on studies. School is good to learn how to do. But the problem with school is we don't learn how to think. And if you really want to become successful, right? You have to know how to think. If you're smart with your money and you're smart with your finances, it's all about now, how can you lean out the company? How can you be creative? How can you attract the top talent? And how can you build and grow? Because if you can build and grow through that downturn that will set you up to thrive. Why is it in the best interest of our financial system and government for them to keep everyone financially illiterate? Let's put it this way. Young and profiters, today we're going to dive into a very important topic, building wealth. And our guest today can help you get serious about doing it. According to Jaspreet Singh, it all starts with the right mindset. Jaspreet is a serial entrepreneur and licensed attorney on a mission to spread financial education through his business, The Minority Mindset, and his extremely popular YouTube channel of the same name. Although he didn't receive any formal financial education, he's on a mission to make financial education fun and accessible. He's helped numerous people get out of debt, start investing, and create a plan towards building wealth. Today, he's going to share his insights on how building wealth can be surprisingly simple. Hey, Jaspreet, welcome to Young and Profiting podcast. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on with you. I am very excited for today's conversation. And so I love the fact that your story is so organic. Like you didn't have this big, bold vision, like I'm going to be this big YouTuber and get all these sponsorships and that's going to be my path. You you just listened to what your audience was telling you. They, they asked you for an Instagram page. They asked you for a blog. Then they asked you for a YouTube channel. And you took it step by step until you grew this brand. And out of your darkest moments can come your shiniest moments and brightest moments. I mean, you got scammed, but that led you to create minority mindset. And now you've got millions and millions of followers. You've guested on uh, shows like Lewis House, Jay Shetty, Impact Theory. So you've really made a name for yourself in this space. Um, what are some of the things that you wish you learned in school that you now teach on your oh, channel, man. Minority Mindset? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this is going to be the rest of the interview is asking you about all these uh, money concepts. You know, honestly, I wish... so. I studied really hard in school um, and there's nothing wrong with school, but I think the problem, well, okay, here's what's wrong with school. What's wrong with school is it doesn't teach you to think. School is good to learn how to do, but the problem with school is we don't learn how to think. And if you really want to become successful, right, you have to know how to think. And so for me, I had to kind of dissect this backwards because why do we go to school? I went to school because I wanted to make money. Right. And it's, it's a lot of people don't want to say that, but I went to school and studied hard because I thought if I did better in school, I'd get a better job and I'd make more money, period. Mm -hmm. Because if I had more money, I could give back to my parents and I could have more nice stuff. I didn't want to make money so I could hoard a bunch of expensive things. I wanted to make money so I could have freedom. But along the way, I realized that's not how it works. If you look at really any wealthy person, and I'm not talking about somebody who has a million dollars. I mean, actually wealthy person. How did they get there? Chances are it wasn't because they got a good degree and climbed that corporate ladder. Chances are it's because they owned assets. They owned some investment. They owned some equity. They owned some business. They owned something that they were able to generate profits out of. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I wish that schools would teach is our economic system. Because at the end of the day, we are going to school to get a job to make money. And so we have to clarify that because we have such a taboo around this topic of money. So many people, the average person does not want to talk about money and they have such a negative connotation around money, yet we're all going to school to get good grades, to earn money, to pay our bills. So money is involved in every single aspect of our life. And so we have to first become understanding of that. Second, once you can become understanding that money has an importance in our life, 
we have to understand how our economic system works. Because in our economic system, we live in a capitalist system. And that has become a very politically charged term nowadays. But the reality is that is our economic system. Which means if you want to win in our economic system, you have to understand how it works. A capitalist system means two things. Number one, it means your income is dependent upon how you earn. And number two, your taxes are dependent on how you pay your taxes. And you'll see what that means. Number one, when it comes to your income, there are two ways that you can generate an income in a capitalist system. One is through your labor. One is through your equity. Your labor means I go to work and I get paid. This is what we learn to do in school, period. We learn to go to get grades, good grades, and get a good job so we can make a bigger salary. When we work to get a bigger salary, we're earning from a labor. It does not matter whether you're making a million dollars a year as a doctor or you're making $10,000 or $20,000 or $30,000 a year as a cashier. You're getting paid from your labor. You will never get rich from your labor alone, period. We were never taught that part. The way that you get actually wealthy is you have to understand the second part of a capitalist system, which is earning money through equity, meaning through your capital. Now, if you didn't guess it, in a capitalist system, if you invest from your capital, you have the ability to earn more money because there's a limit to how much you can do, but there's no limit to how much you can own. So in a capitalist system, what every single wealthy person does, every single wealthy person understands this because they have this level of financial education, but the vast majority of Americans do not understand this. Every single wealthy person wants to earn from what they own, not from what they do. Because when you earn from what you own, now there's no limit to how much you can earn. Because now you can keep working to buy more assets, whether it's stocks, whether it's real estate, whether it's businesses, whether it's whatever it is. Now you're working not for a salary, but for profits. Equity gives you access to profits. So if you start a business, I know a lot of your audience are entrepreneurs. If you start a business, and you made $100,000 in profit this year. And I'm assuming you don't pay yourself. Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to treat yourself like an employee, meaning you got to pay yourself a salary. So if you pay yourself a $50,000 a year salary, that means your business makes $50,000. If your business makes $50,000 of profit, that goes to the owners. If you are the only owner of your business, that goes to you. If you go out and get investors, it goes to the investors. But if you're running the company, you are the CEO of a company and you're getting paid a salary. You're getting paid to work in the company. The person who gets paid for owning the company are the shareholders, the owners. And so where the real wealth is built in America is through equity, through this capital. That's the first part of a capitalist system is you want to own from your capital more than your labor. The second part that you have to understand is taxes. Now, I'll tell you this as an attorney, who's not your attorney, because when my parents found out that I wasn't going to be a doctor, we made a compromise that, uh, well, my dad had this talk with me that if you want to have any pride in the family, you have to at least go out and become an attorney. So I said, <laughs> okay, I can do that because uh, I found out that you can go to law school part-time. And if I go to law school part-time, I could work on my business full-time. So I went to law school and then I never worked a day as an attorney because I was fortunate enough to see enough success from my businesses at that time. But as an attorney, what I can tell you, who's not your attorney, is that our tax code taxes income differently depending on how you earn your money. We have three general buckets of income. You have earned income, portfolio income, and passive income. Earned income is the money you make from your job. Portfolio income is money from your investments, things like selling a stock for a profit. Passive income is money you make from things like your real estate investments. And the income that comes at the highest tax rates and the lowest tax write-offs are your earned income, which means now you're going to school to get good grades, to get a good job, to earn a big salary, which is the labor part of your income, which is the worst way to get paid. Mm -hmm. And then that labor comes at the highest tax rates and the lowest tax deductions. Something is broken in that system because now we're taught to just follow what everybody else is doing. But if you keep doing what everybody else does, you're going to end up just like everybody else. And today in America, that's broke because the majority of Americans are broke. And this is where everybody thinks, oh man, the solution to my financial problems is I need to earn more money. And that can help. But the reality is, I'm going to speak just reality for the majority of Americans, 
more money leads to bigger financial distress. Statistically, mm. when the majority of Americans make more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. Why? Because when most people make more money, they go and finance a bigger car. They go and finance a bigger vacation. They go and buy a bigger home. You're getting all these other liabilities now and you never have the ability to invest and actually build any true wealth because you're constantly just making more money to make everybody else rich. Statistically in America today, more than half of Americans that are making six figures a year are living paycheck to paycheck and broke. So it's not just how much money you earn, it's what you do with the money. That's the capitalist side. But then you have to understand the income side. Our tax code is even saying you need to go out and be financially educated, but we're never taught that part. And that's one of the things that I'm kind of been working to spread that education of, whether it's through briefs media or through minority mindset. But it's like that basic level of we've never been taught this because when I first learned this, it made me so angry because I felt like I was doing everything right. I was studying hard. I was doing good in school. I was, I mean, I was so focused on my academics that that was like the only thing besides playing football in high school. There was nothing else that I spent my time on. I would hmm. not do anything else so I could study because I thought that's what I needed to do to succeed financially. But there's so much more to that financial success, which is the financial education component that I was never taught. I went through law school. And I never learned to think about building wealth, cash flow, investing during all of my entire schooling. Mm. I learned that on my own. So this is really getting my wheel spinning. I feel like I have so many follow-up questions for you. The first one is, why is it in the best interest of our financial system and government for them to keep everyone financially illiterate? Like, why does our government and banks want us to be financially illiterate? Well, let's put it this way. The number one asset on the United States balance sheet today is student loans. Now, you hear everybody talking about how bad student loans are from the government, that they're keeping millennials from being able to buy a home or buy a car. Yet, you go to Google and you search the number one asset on the United States balance sheet, you will see that the student loans are part of the reason why the United States is able to make so much money. Second, if you were financially educated, you would think twice about financing a G-Wagon that you couldn't afford. See, if you thought twice about financing the G-Wagon, then the bank wouldn't be making that interest. And that means the car dealership wouldn't be making that money either. So it is not in their best interest to tell you, maybe you shouldn't go out and finance this car because that means they don't get paid. And so corporations are in the business of selling you things. Banks are in the business of lending you money. If they are in the business of trying to get you to give them your money, it's not in their best interest to teach you how to keep your money and grow your money. Although you would think that if you knew how to grow your money, you'd be able to spend more because now you have more money to spend. Unfortunately, that's just not what people do. And this is where now it is your duty to now protect yourself and educate yourself financially. But we're never taught how to do that. So this is where now, again, schools don't teach it. You got to go out every way to learn it. Now, thankfully, we have podcasts and YouTube and, and educational places on the internet that are free and easily accessible that have never been there before. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that changes over the next two decades. But this is that basic level of education that it is not in the government, corporations, or bank's best interest to keep you financially educated because that means they make less money. Mm. And uh, I know on your YouTube channel and your other channel, some of the things that you teach is money habits. And you talk about money habits that keep people poor. Can you talk to us about some of the habits that people have that keep them poor? This episode is brought to you by Relay, the number one bank for small business owners. Relay is an online banking and money management platform that is the official banking partner of Profit First. With Relay, business owners can create up to 20 individual accounts and automate their Profit First allocations so that when money comes into your income account, Account, it's automatically distributed to your other accounts based on the percentages that you've set up. It all happens automatically and there's no account fees, 
no overdraft fees, no minimum balances, and you can make unlimited payments via ACH wires or bank checks. They also have great integrations for syncing with accounting softwares like QuickBooks and Xero. If you're a small business owner, you need banking that is truly built for your business. And if you have even the slightest interest in Profit First, or if you simply want a banking solution that was designed specifically for the needs of small business owners, then I recommend giving Relay a try. It's easy to apply online and it's absolutely free. You can sign up today by visiting RelayFI.com slash profiting. Again, that's RelayFI.com slash profiting. The link is in our show notes. Give them a try. I hope you do. The first thing, I mean, ultimately, I could talk about spending habits, but it ultimately comes down to somebody's mindset Mm -hmm. around how they're looking at money. Because if you look at money and you don't really care about it, or you, you have this YOLO mentality, which a lot of people do, because I'll post things on, on Instagram. I remember this was a post that I made a little while ago, and it, and it created a lot of controversy, and I did not expect it to, which was um, if you invested $100 a month from the ages of 21 until 65, and you put this money into the S&P 500, which is a group of the largest financial comp- uh, 500 companies on the stock market, and you did that for those years, and you never invested more than the $100 a month that you always did, that you would have retired a millionaire. And that created so much controversy because people were very upset by this whole idea that why would I want to wait until I'm 65 or 66 to become a millionaire? And sure, if you don't want to wait until you are 66 to become a millionaire, that's perfectly fine. But the path to becoming a millionaire is you make money, you don't spend it, and then you invest it. Instead, what people say is, I'd rather just enjoy that money now. YOLO, what happens if I don't make it until 65? Who knows if I'm going to be alive that long? I don't even know if I'm going to be able to enjoy my money when I'm 65. So might as well just spend it today. And so what ends up happening is instead of planning for tomorrow, we just want to enjoy our life today and spend our money today. And that is really more of a mindset thing than a practicality thing of what I do with my money. Because when you have that like short-term mindset with money, you're never going to achieve any sort of financial success because you're always thinking about, well, you know what? I'd rather just finance that Gucci bag today because who cares? And it's the same thing with starting a business. Starting a business is hard, not just because you have to learn a lot of things, but because you have to have the discipline to work for tomorrow, next week, and next year, maybe even next decade, depending on what the business is. And sometimes, or a lot of times, you have to put in all these reps but in all this work, see no success and then keep going because you think that there's a chance that your business might potentially succeed. So that dedication and that discipline is not easy because now you're going against what everybody's saying because now when you're doing this, your friends are looking at you like you lost your mind. Like, yo, why don't you just go get a regular job like everybody else and make some decent money? Mm -hmm. Your parents don't understand why you're a failure. You're sitting there working on some dumb business idea, trying to figure out how to make it work. You're sitting there like, oh, I know that this can work. Everybody's doubting me, but I want to prove them wrong. I just need a little more time, but you don't know if it will succeed or not. And you have to still be able to silence not just the internal voices in your head that are saying, don't do it, but then you have to silence all the external voices that are saying, you're stupid, you're a failure, you're doing it wrong, you should have just listened to what everybody else is saying, you should just follow what everybody else does. And you have to still keep going after you get scammed, after you get screwed over, after people say things to you, and you just got to keep going. And that's not easy. And that's that mindset of now, I have the discipline, I know what I want. And mm-hmm. I don't care what you say. I believe in me, even if you don't. And you just got to keep going. And what's interesting then is once you start to see that success, that's when everybody says, I've always believed in you. I knew yeah. you were going to succeed. I had faith in you from the beginning. You know what? That's, that's, that's the part of really being a successful investor and an entrepreneur. It's the same journey. Yeah. Totally agree. First, they ask you why you're doing it. Then they ask you how you did it. (laughs) Um, So I totally agree with that. Let's talk about uh, spending money on dumb things. We were just talking about people saying YOLO in the comments. And I know that you give advice to stop spending money on dumb things you can't afford. So what's the easiest way to understand what you can afford and what you can't afford? Well, Let's, let's, let, I want to go back to what you said about dumb things, because I think that's a very important topic. Mm. What wealthy people do, 
is they don't spend hard-earned money on dumb things. What the middle class does is they spend their hard-earned money buying dumb things. And what the poor do is they are financing dumb things. Now, what does that mean? What is a dumb thing? A dumb thing is something that doesn't put any money in your pocket. That BMW in your driveway, it's a dumb thing. That Toyota, it's a dumb thing. Those clothes, it's a dumb thing. That vacation, it's a dumb thing. Now, nothing wrong with having dumb things. We all like dumb things. That's okay. The question is, how are you buying it? Because what wealthy people want to do is they don't want to work hard to buy those dumb things. That's what the middle class people want to do. I want to get a raise so I can buy a, a dumb car. I want to get a bigger promotion so I can have a dumb home. Maybe you want to have that nice stuff. I'm calling it dumb just to make it stick in your brain. Call it whatever you want. But what wealthy people want to do is they want to own assets that will then pay for their dumb things. Because if I can work to build, let's just say, a couple of rental properties that are paying me $1,000 a month, now, if I use that money to go out and buy a dumb watch, I don't have to work hard to get it. I worked hard to buy the assets, and the assets keep paying me to buy my dumb things. That's what wealthy people are working for. They're working to own the assets that pay for the dumb things, while the middle class are working hard to buy those dumb things, and that's what keeps the majority of people broke. Now, it goes back to, well, how do you know if you can afford it or not? Because the reality is, if I'm going to be just completely honest, for the average person to be able to fund their lifestyle through their assets, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of work. It doesn't happen tomorrow, and you got to be able to feed yourself and have a car and do all that nice stuff too. So how do you know what you can afford? Well, the first thing is stop financing things that don't pay you, period. Mm. And this goes to your car too. And this, this is, I know, upsets a lot of people, but the reality is you got a $50,000 car in your driveway. If you can't afford that $50,000 car with cash, don't go out and buy it. And that's where people say, well, how am I supposed to be able to afford a car then if I can't finance it? Well, you put $8,000 down to go out and buy that $50,000 car, take that down payment, go out and buy a used car. And that one's tough because now you got to downgrade from a BMW to a Toyota Corolla used. And this is so hard because when you start to make money, your car is one of the easiest ways to show it off. I like nice cars. But the first time I made a million dollars in a year, I'm driving a car that doesn't have a bumper on it. It's got a crack in the windshield that's got rust on the sides. Because I know I want to take that money and put it back into my own asset, put it back into my own business. My employees are driving better cars than me because I know that that car is just a liability. So I want to put my money into an asset that's going to pay me first. So if you're financing your car, that's the first thing you want to take a look at because now not only is that car losing value, but you're paying interest on that car that's losing value. So it's a double whammy. So stop financing things that don't pay you. The only exception to this would be the home that you live in. Then when it goes to actually buying some things, you have to make sure you can actually be able to afford it, not just buy it. You want to go out and buy a $1,000 phone? Most people assume that Okay, if I can't finance it, because that's most people's definition of affording a new $1,000 phone, I can afford the $80 monthly payment. Well, we already said, well, you can't do that. Now, if you want to buy the $1,000 phone, if I got $1,000 in the bank, I can afford the $1,000 phone, right? No. If you want to actually be able to afford that phone, what I like to do is follow what I call a rule of five, which says if I can't buy five of them, I can't afford one of them. So if you got $1,000 in the bank, you can go out and afford comfortably a $200 phone. And mm. this now requires, and this is hard. I know people hearing this like, Dude, what the heck is wrong with this guy? Is this guy crazy? How am I supposed to live my life and even eat? This is going to require serious cutbacks on a lot of people's lifestyles. But the reality is becoming financially fit is not for everybody. It's not easy and it's tough. And I mean, it's, it's just, it's a sacrifice. It is not easy. I never said it was going to be easy. Not only now are you going to have to make cutbacks, your spouse is going to look at you like you lost your mind. Your parents are going to look at you like you lost your mind. Your friends are going to think you like that you lost your mind too. And then on top of that, you have to start living a little bit smaller. Is it possible? Yeah. Is it hard? Absolutely. But if you do that, now all of a sudden, you're going to find more money. And this more money, now you can start putting towards your assets. I call it a decade of sacrifice. You got to put in the decade of work where you're living smaller and working to earn more money 
just so you can buy more assets. And if you go through that decade of sacrifice, which most people, the majority of people will not be willing to do that, but if you can go through that decade of sacrifice, you will be able to come out of this decade way wealthier and you will be able to go out and buy the nice stuff that you want, those dumb things, and no longer have to really worry about the price. While everybody else is figuring out how they can pay it off, you can go out and buy it without even worrying about it. Hmm. It's going through that real sacrifice of how can you spend less and earn more. Hmm. So one thing that you mentioned a few times is never finance anything that isn't going to pay you. What's an example of something that you finance that does pay you? So this could be potentially going out and buying rental properties. This could be potentially going out and buying a business. It could potentially, and I say this with a word of caution, because I know a lot of your audience are entrepreneurs, be used in your business to finance your growth. But if you're just starting off as an entrepreneur, do not go into debt. It's one of the most risky things they can do. If your business is making $3 million a year, and now you're like, you know what? If we had an extra $1 million, we would be able to scale this from $3 million to $25 million. We just have to go out and invest in this new machinery or something along those lines. And you don't want to go out and sell equity in your company because you know that the equity is going to be way more valuable than the 9% you have to pay on the debt. That is a, a different financial decision as opposed to, well, I want to start this business idea. How about I go out and finance it? I remember talking to my bank manager one day. I walked in. And they were telling me about this client that wanted to buy this, this pet grooming business. And I think they wanted to get like an $85,000 loan for this pet grooming business. They didn't own or buy any real estate with it. It was just a business inside one of this retail strip plazas. And that $85,000 business was going to be a losing business because I think it made forty dollars or $45,000 a year. But the owner who worked in the business didn't pay themselves a salary. Mm. So that's 40, they, they say they're making 45 grand a year, but they're not paying themselves anything. So if you pay yourself 45 grand a year, the business makes $0. And then on top of that, there was this clause which said that they had no um, restrictive covenants, meaning that owner could have sold the business and then opened up another pet grooming business right on the other side of the street. Like there was no non-complete clause. And so this lady was thinking about buying that business for $85,000. And thankfully, the manager denied them. He said, this is just too risky for us. But this is where, if you're starting off as an entrepreneur, do not go into debt to start your business ventures. Yeah, no. Go out and hustle. But if you're, if you're making a few million dollars a year and you, wanna, and you know how you can scale it and you don't want to sell equity, you want to raise debt, then that's something you can consider, but understand the risks. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to say something that you might disagree with. So like, as you're talking about, like, be be frugal, don't spend all your money, don't spend more than you can afford. All I keep thinking about as a hustler, as somebody who's been an entrepreneur for a long time, and now I'm making a ton of money. But when I was younger, you know, I had to get there. My mentality is always like, let me just work, work and make more money, make more money, make more money. Now it's, it's worked for me, right? Uh, that mentality. And I spent whatever I want, wanted. And what I, I spent on uh, sort of like Ramit Sethi, he also has been on the show, his perspective of like your money dial. So what do you actually enjoy? So it's like I spent money on things I liked, clothes, bags, whatever, whenever I wanted. And my mentality was like, I'm going to work hard, bust my butt, worked like 16 hour days a lot for many, many years. And, you know, now my business this year is going to make five million dollars a year, you know, so it's like I did well having that mentality. But not everyone, I think can be that way, that scrappier or can make money from nothing. I basically made money from literally nothing. I had no investors. I just did it from just grit and hustle. So what's your perspective on that? Because I think some people don't fit in this personality of, of just being frugal. Like, I don't think I would have been as successful had I not sort of also spoiled myself in the way that I wanted to be spoiled along the way, if that makes sense. Well, you had the money to buy it. You, you, yeah. You weren't going into debt to buy those handbags. No. If you can, I have nothing against buying nice things. If you want to buy something nice, go ahead. Just make sure you can afford it first. If you, if you got $100,000 in the bank and you're thinking about buying a $5,000 bag, you can buy it with the rule of five easy, right? It's, it's, it's just a matter of understanding, okay, well, you know, I could invest the money, but I, I feel like I want this. All right, fine. There's nothing wrong with buying nice things. Go out and buy it. Uh, but just understand, you know, if you invested it, you might be able to get a little bit more return, but you got to enjoy your life too. Yeah. As long as you can afford it. 
Yeah, totally. Okay, so let's say we save our money. How should we go about thinking about retirement? Because I think a lot of the entrepreneurs listening to this show, we don't have the same advantages of working in corporate where there's like a 401k match and it's all formal. Some of us may have 401ks if we are able to get them privately or whatever. But how should we think about retirement as entrepreneurs? So, well, if you're an entrepreneur, chances are you're probably not thinking about retirement because you started a business because you love the business. And so uh, for most entrepreneurs, retirement is really not something you really think about. So if you are an entrepreneur, I would say the first thing is understanding what does that actually look like for you? Because I personally could never see myself sitting on a beach every day and doing nothing. I have to be doing something. Like if I go on a vacation with my wife, she knows I'm spending half the day working because if I'm not working, I just, I just don't feel right. I enjoy what I do. So the first thing is, what do you want to do? Now, eventually, yeah, there's going to be a point where you might want to wind down a little bit, but what does that actually look like? Now, if you want to be able to generate income without you having to work, the way you do that is by buying assets. Now, there's two ways to do that as an entrepreneur. You have the, the I am the Elon Musk way, where you're putting all of your wealth back into the business that you make money, you don't care about stocks, you don't care about real estate. All you're doing is trying to build your business, period. Well, now your value is in the business. You could potentially sell the business, assuming that you have a sellable business. There's a great book called uh, Built to Sell. I think that's what it's called. Um, I highly recommend that book if you want to know how to build a sellable business. Otherwise, you could take the alternative option, which is you pay yourself a salary for working in the business. This is what I do. I pay myself a salary. Then out of the salary that you pay, get, get paid, you treat yourself like an employee where you invest that money like any employee would do at somebody else's company. Like I invest my money into stocks, into real estate, into startups, but you have to treat yourself like an employee and work to build that, that retirement fund or whatever you want to call it um, using the income that you're generating. And this is where you're going to have to decide that balance because if you take money out of your business, and you go put it into the stock market, you might be able to get a seven, eight, nine, maybe 10% return on your money. That would be like a great case scenario. You're not guaranteed to make money, it might go down, but historically that's what we've seen. In your business, your money could grow by 20, 30, 40, 200, 300, 400, 2000%. There's really no limit, but your business could go bankrupt tomorrow and you have nothing to show for it. So you kind of have to figure out what type of entrepreneur and personality you want to be and where along the spectrum you are. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm definitely an entrepreneur myself, just so for my listeners, I tend to invest most of my money back into my business, all my podcaster money that I get from sponsorships, I put straight back into my business. Um, and that's how I was able to do it with no investors. So let's talk about active versus passive strategies. You were just talking about investing. First of all, what is the difference between an active strategy and a passive strategy? So I call an active strategy when I'm looking for an individual investment. If I go out and I buy a piece of real estate, that's an active investment because I have to go and find this property. If I go out and I invest in individual stock, I have to find that stock. If I go out and invest in a startup, I have to find that startup. So these are all active strategies for me. A passive strategy is now, like for me, every Wednesday, I have cash that leaves my checking account and it automatically gets invested into a portfolio of ETFs. These are funds in the stock market. This happens automatically, whether the market's up or down. I don't even have to touch it. It just happens without me even looking at it. So that happens every Wednesday, no matter what. So my passive strategy is autopilot. My active strategy is me going out and looking for individual deals. Now, what you need to do as an investor is figure out what type of investor do you want to be? Because some people want to be involved. They like to read financial statements. They want to go out and actually look for these deals and be spending that time doing that. More risk, more potential return. Others will say, I don't got time for that. I'm trying to run my business. Or I'm not interested in doing that. I have other things to do. Or I just want to not have to stress about it because the markets just scare me. That's fine. So you just kind of have to pick which strategy is right for you. And then, or maybe both. And then fund that strategy. The active strategy, you got to fund it. And then you have to go out and actually find the deal. Like you're looking for a good deal at a good price. The passive strategy is just 
every week, every two weeks, every month, money just automatically keeps flowing into your investments. Mm. And so I know that you love real estate. You've been doing it for a long time. At what point in our journeys do you suggest that we dabble in real estate? Is there a certain amount of cash we should have? Or like, how do you suggest, like, when is the green light to know, like, you're ready to start investing in real estate? There's really, I want to say there's a green light. Like I, I, I got started in real estate during the bottom of the 2008 crash. So you don't need much money to get started then. But I was also doing it at a time where most people were not investing in real estate. Even the people that had way more money than I did, way more education than I did. So I think the main thing is you got to make sure you could afford the deal and you have to make sure that the deal is actually making sense financially, meaning that it's cash flowing. Um, because what a lot of people do, and you see this in every real estate cycle, is people will buy a real estate deal. Let's just say they bought this deal for $100,000 and it will make next to no money in profit every year, or maybe $1,000 in profit a year, a 1% return. Because they think that they're going to be able to sell this property for $200,000 in 12 to 24 months. So they don't care about the cash flow. I don't recommend doing that. Because what happens if you can't sell it for profit? What happens if the economy goes down? What happens if something goes wrong in a neighborhood and now you can't sell it? Now, not only are you not making any money, your money is tied up and you can't get out. Maybe you have to sell it for a loss. That's too risky for me. So what I look for is I look for deals that have cash flow. Generally, I'm looking for a 7% cash on cash return. So if I'm buying a $100,000 property, I'm assuming all cash for this example. I want to see $7,000 of profit after expenses hitting my bank account every year without factoring in appreciation. Now, if home prices go up, Good. If they go down, no big deal. I'm still getting my cash flow. And even if something goes wrong in the economy and we have to cut rents, I still have a margin to be able to reduce rents and still be profitable. So I think the first thing is just knowing your strategy. And then second, being able to actually go out, find a deal and afford that deal. Because, you know, people talk about no money down real estate on the internet. No money down real estate has been extremely profitable for me. Not because mm -hmm. I'm buying real estate, no money down but because those no money down people end up in foreclosure and then their banks come to me to sell me the property for pennies on the dollar. So <laughs> I do not recommend no money down real estate um, because it's extremely risky, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and you were the first to lose your shirt when things go wrong. Mm. That's some great advice. Um, so one quote that I found from you is you say, everyone in America should be a business owner. However, not everybody should be in the business of starting a company and not everybody should be in the business of operating a company. Talk to us about that. In America, in this capitalist system, you make money through equity. Where That's where wealth is built. How do you get the equity? You can get the equity from owning real estate ideally rental properties, or you can get the equity from investing in other businesses. Business owners are the wealthy people in America, along with real estate owners. You have to be a business owner. Now, most people should not be trying to manage a company or build a company or start a company. How do you do that? Well, the stock market has made it very accessible. You can start investing in companies with as little as a dollar. And the, the thing that, that a lot of people get kind of down on is, well, if I invest $1,000, that's a lot of money I have to invest. I might not see that much of a return. I might even lose my money. But the thing is, the goal isn't to invest $1,000 one time. The goal is to invest $1,000 every month for the next three decades. Now you'll start to see that money grow and compound and really start to build more ownership and equity, which is where now you can start to see that growth in your equity. And that's mm -hmm. where everybody in America needs to be a business owner. That way you can win in this economic system because not only now do you get that profit share, but you also get the tax benefits mm. of investing instead of just earning from your labor. Yeah, that's so true. And as we close out the interview, I just want to talk about recession and the economy for a moment. So I want this show to be evergreen. A lot of people go back years later, right? So I'm not going to ask you if we're going into a recession or not. What I'm going to ask you is for whenever we seem to be going into a recession, how can we thrive as entrepreneurs? Well, recessions create more opportunity than any other time. And if you look at it from the perspective of an entrepreneur, some of the biggest companies around today were created during recessions. Uber, Airbnb, I even think Microsoft was started during a recession. 
So it creates opportunity because if you're an entrepreneur, number one, people are looking for jobs when a recession happens. And when people are desperate for jobs, they're willing to work for less money. So mm. if you're an entrepreneur, that can benefit you in that sense. Now, it's tough because people don't always have money to buy your products, but this forces you to be more creative. This forces you to be more lean. And really, again, it goes back to smart financing of your company because if you have a ton of debt and now people are not buying your stuff, you have a whole bunch of expenses that you can't get rid of because you can't make that debt go away. But if you're smart with your money and you're smart with your finances, now it's all about now how can you lean out the company how can you be creative? How can you attract the top talent? And how can you build and grow? Because if you can build and grow through that downturn, that will set you up to thrive when mm. the economy is growing as well. So just breathe. thank you so much for sharing all of this financial knowledge. Uh, before we close the show, I'm going to ask two questions that I ask all my guests. The first is, what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? The first thing that I would say, because I was just having a conversation with one of my friends about this, is if you have cash sitting around in a savings account, check and see if it's a high interest savings account. Because at the time when I was recording this, you have a lot of high interest savings accounts that are paying 4 to 5% in interest for doing nothing except sitting there that are FDIC insured. So if you have some extra cash sitting around, at least are generating a little bit of interest on that. Mm, I just realized I didn't ask you about inflation. Talk to us about what we need to know about inflation, because I think that's really important for my listeners to hear. Well, inflation is a hidden tax. It disproportionately hurts the financially uneducated, and it disproportionately benefits the financially educated, because inflation hurts consumers. It hurts your ability to spend. Whether you're rich class, rich, middle class, or poor, everybody has to spend. Everybody is a consumer. So when you go and buy a new car, you go out and buy your groceries, or you buy a vacation, you're going to pay more dollars. But it benefits the investors because now if you are an investor, you own a piece of the production, meaning you own a piece of the business that's selling the items. So mm -hmm. if your business is selling the items for more dollars, you benefit from inflation. So inflation hurts the average person while benefiting the financially educated. Interesting. And so for a high yield saving, savings account, is there a number that we should look for? Should it at least be like 3%, for example? Like what's what should we try to look at for that? It's going to depend on when you're watching this video, but <laughs> shop around. Okay. I think that's the best piece of advice is just shop around. Just like how if you're going to buy a new car, you're going to look at different dealerships, shop around with online banks. If uh, most banks are paying five and your bank is paying 0.025, well, you can uh, take a look at one of the better ones. Yeah, that's an easy way. That's an easy fix. Okay, so what is your secret to profiting in life? And this can go beyond finances. Being willing to keep coming back. Um, you know, I think I, the one benefit that I had um, or the advantage that I had wasn't that, you know, I had all these resources or, or all these mentors and guides but that I kind of was like, I'll do whatever it takes type of mentality that I kept. Um, where, like when I was in college, I had this thing where I didn't really care about sleeping. I don't recommend doing this, but when I was in college, you're young, you're 17, 18, 19 years old, you don't need sleep. And I was working around the clock. Like I was in class all day. I'd be working on my event planning business at night. On Fridays after class, I would, you know, get things set up for the party. Uh, I'd be at the club from 10 or way before 10, but the party would start at 10 p.m. It would go until 2 in the morning. After 2 in the morning, we got to, you know, pack up, leave, get some food. I'm not in bed until 4 in the morning. The next morning on Saturday now, I'm working at weddings and Indian weddings start early in the morning. So I went to bed at 4 in the morning. I probably got to wake up at 6 in the morning to be at the wedding by 7.30 setting up there. I'm working at the wedding from 7.30 in the morning now until at least midnight. Then on Sunday, you start back up again. And, and you know, it's just like I I was driven. Um, and so it, it's kind of like that do whatever it takes is mentality is something that I've always had. And uh, I know that for me, if I don't have an advantage, 
with experience or mentors or something else, I can make up for that with effort. Mm. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Just Bree, where can everybody find more about you and everything that you do? Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and the opportunity. Um, if you want to see more of my content, you can check it out on uh, YouTube, Minority Mindset. You can check out Briefs Media uh, for free newsletters. We have free newsletters on what's happening in the financial markets. We have a bunch of education there as well. If you're looking for uh, classes or if you want uh, educational newsletters, you can go to briefs.co. That's briefs.co. And we have a bunch of content there as well. Awesome. Well, I'll stick all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for the opportunity. 